everybody. This is Dr. Alice Lee. Welcome to iCube episode number 33. Yeah, 33. Okay, I have a repeat guest. Dr. Graf has been with us several times, three times already. And this is number four. And I have a, such a great case for him. So, Dr. Graf, thank you for joining me again. Would you introduce yourself? Thanks, uh, Dr. Lee. So I have been practicing for just about 20 years in emergency medicine. Hey. Uh, Where did you do your residency? So it was UCLA residency, and uh, got to spend a lot of time in a lot of different facilities, yeah. including in Bakersfield at Kern Medical Center. I always, I've always enjoyed you coming on. So I have this terrific case I want to talk to you about. Um, this is a 29-year-old who was put in the room already. Uh, he's diabetic. And the paramedics report that he was having this panic attack, shortness of breath, and he was really agitated, so they had to give him Ativan on the way in. Um, he was complaining of nausea and stomach pain, right? In addition, um, they had an AccuCheck pre-hospital. It's 442, and they gave him this Ativan because he was, like, um, having this panic attack, they, they said. So I get pulled into the room because he was acutely ill. Um, he's a young guy. He's 29. He looks fit. He's lying on the gurney. and it, um, he's very tachypneic, very tachypneic, and he's agitated, restless. Mm -hmm. These are the vitals, blood pressure 117 over 50, heart rate is 130, respirators are 40, uh, sats are 100% on room air. Um, so, you know, he looks sick. So he said he'd been sick for about 15 hours, just feeling very short of breath, has abdominal pain and very nauseous. Um, what do you think so far with this patient? How would you manage him? Yeah, it is concerning. You get a young individual like that, yeah. a sugar uh, like that, mm -hmm. certainly tachypnea. You get concerned, you know, is this guy now in DKA? Is that why he's looking so ill? Right, uh, and, right. And so you definitely want to make sure that's taken care of. It didn't, even though he was very tachypnic, it seems more metabolic than you'd think as a primary respiratory, whether it's a PE, a young guy like this. Um, those are things that you think of, the worst case scenarios. Am I going to have to intubate this patient? Is there something else that's contributing to it? And especially when you don't get much more history, you start going down the worst case scenarios first. So that's, that's the way I would look at it. First of all, likely DKA. But is there something else that you would have to work up concomitantly? What do you think of the uh, anxiety or panic attack that the paramedics report? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's an interesting thing. You know, we see that a lot uh, when someone has a primary respiratory issue. They get very anxious. And, uh, of course, in our population, we sometimes will get people who uh, I've been using recreational drugs, and they can do that too. You have to think of that because it's the likelihood's high up. They have, you know, potentially serious consequences. Right. So just like you said, I had the similar type of uh, differential diagnosis. There's a whole slew of uh, di um, differential diagnosis on a young man that looks like this, right? So what kind mm -hmm. of test would you start off with, Jonathan? Well, we, we already know a blood sugar released by EMS. Uh, and so, you know, making sure that we're getting them on the monitors, we're getting fluids started, large amount of fluids, two IVs. So initial testing, I in these cases, I start treating and testing at the same time. Right. So, I, so I'm getting an x-ray, I'm getting, you know, the, uh, the BMP or the CMP and the white count. Um, certainly get a urine. I'll probably get a urine tox on him. Right. Um, right. We can, so those are the things I would, I would uh, you know, first and foremost, get those done. Sometimes you can get just a venous gas uh, at the same time. Yeah. And then the other things you want to think about, we said uh, recreational drugs, but also someone who might have uh, been taking extra uh, medications, whether it's acetaminophen or salicylates or something right. else like that. Right. We talked about a salicylate case before, Alice, so I don't want to miss that one. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right. Well, I, you know, I, on these really sick patients, I do bedside uh, POCT because they're so sick and I just want to roll out very critical things initially and the stat EKG. So that's what I did. What do you think of the EKG? It doesn't look good. 
<laughs> <laughs> yeah, that doesn't look good. You get this wide, complex rhythm yeah. that's in there, tachycardic. So now you're thinking of, yeah, does he have renal issues, the potassium you know, high? Mm-hmm. And so that point of care testing, I like that. So bedside, this is my bedside POCT. Nice. <laughs> nice. Look at that potassium, 8.4. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, yeah. So within a few minutes, this is all done because he was just looking ill. And I thought, okay, this is not a panic attack. There's no way. There's some, something really wrong with this guy. And that EKG was just uh, so almost pathognomonic. You know, his glucose is greater than 600. His uh, lactate is 9.9. His potassium, bingo, is 8.4, right? Right. So, um, so my emergency department therapy was calcium chloride, albuterol, SVNs, 10 milligrams, IV bicarbonate, uh, dextrose, insulin, um, no more Ativan for the young man. And I did not give him an X- a KX. I've been getting away from that actually lately. Um, I think the real point in a young guy like this is, uh, does he need to go to dialysis and will KX late? Um, you know, what's the time frame? Are you in a facility that you can get that right away or will be there? Will there be downtime? Excellent. Right. So then here, look at that. After all that ED treatment uh, for hyper K, this is his EKG. Uh-huh. Well, you are, you're saving lives. <laughs> I'm sure you would have to. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that EKG looks beautiful now. <laughs> definitely improved and yeah. so yeah uh, i got the rest of the labs back potassium was 8.7 from the lab beta hydroxy butyrate was 133 which is quite high and his creatinine was uh, 2.1 um look at that serum glucose of almost a thousand yeah exactly twice of what twice of what ems noted the blood gas is also quite <laughs> quite impressive pH of 7.08 uh, with the uh, bicarb of only 3 uh, and then the base excess of tw- negative 27. With the um, CBC, it was an impressive white count as well. Um, there wasn't any obvious source, so that may be just a, a reaction, deep granulation reaction for something we're so sick. As you know, I have usually... Um, two learning focuses to try to drill down to what's most important. And also I try to teach interesting things. So the first learning focus on this patient is KXLH demise. I want to talk a bit about that. Um, So when we see the hyper-K patients, these are the four categories that we uh, think of in terms of how to get the hyperkalemia reduced. Membrane stabilization, intracellular shift, excretion and then removal so we talked about all the meds that i had prescribed for this guy and the uh, kxlate i withheld um kxlate is uh used for the excretion part of the treatment for hyper k right it's been a standard treatment all through my career ever since i was a young baby doctor so kxlate is uh sodium polystyrene sulfonate sps it was approved for hyperkalemia treatment in 1958, so greater than 50 years. It was based on two studies, just two studies in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1961. There was only a total of 42 patients that they studied that on. So what wow. it does is it exchanges sodium for potassium in the colon, and then it's excreted out of the body. There actually is no proof it does low potassium emergently and those two studies that this uh, approval was based on had major design flaws okay i listened to em cast with Alma too this was a may uh podcast and one of the um such segments was on hyperkalemia controversies and they reviewed this recent clinical review uh, called Controversies in Management of Hyperkalemia. And this was actually just published in 2018. It's a very, very, very thorough review of uh, hyperkalemia treatment. Um, and uh, the controversy basically is k and, and and how it should not be used. Then there are some recent articles that also kind of uh, uh, piqued my interest. Uh, one was in uh, Emergency Medicine by Dr. Swami uh, Swami Nathan, he's a, a, quite a, 
uh, prolific educator and writer. He says, a review of the literature shows that there is virtually no benefit in the emergent setting for SPS or k Then, uh. Then just recently, Dr. Rundy came out with an article in the Emergency Medicine News. He reviews and he goes through a very, very hot off the press article uh, out of Ontario, Canada by Dr. Noel. Uh, and he says, a quote, should print a copy of this excellent study by Dr. Noel and use it as an a- academic shield to protect your patients from this useless and harmful relic. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so we've been using that religiously for <laughs> decades. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Yes. I went through and I read this article that Dr. Rundy um, referred to, the risk of hospitalization for serious adverse gastrointestinal events associated with sodium polycyrene sulfonate use in patients of advanced age. So let's go over this article. This was... Um, Dr. Noel M.D. et al. It was published in June of 2019, just a few months ago, uh, in JAMA Internal Medicine. It was a retrospective matched cohort study. The age uh, of the patients was 66 or over. Um, the study population were patients that were prescribed k between 2003 through 2015. And this is all in Ontario, Canada. There were 20,020 patients that were prescribed KXLate who were matched with 20,020 patients without KXLate. That's a large N, <laughs> which is... That is huge, I yeah. Know. It was all in an outpatient setting, and the average age of the patients were 78.5 years old, and 55% were male, 45% were females. Very, very conventional with our patient population, right? Right. Very mm-hmm. applicable. Where we practice, Alice, yeah. So their primary outcome was uh, looking for three complications within 30 days. First was intestinal ischemia or thrombosis. Number two is GI ulceration slash perforation. And number three was GI resection and ostomy. So the results of their study, those patients that had k had 37 events, which was 0.2% versus the controls, 18 events, which is 0.1%. And the most common injury was intestinal ischemia and thrombosis. Their conclusion at the end of the article was, let me just read that because I think it's very um, very well put. Our large population level retrospective matched cohort study investigating GI outcomes in outpatients receiving SPS found a significant and consistent association of serious adverse GI events with the use of the drug. These findings require confirmation and suggest that clinicians should exercise caution in prescribing sodium polystyrene sulfonate. So when I actually read the details of this study, I thought to myself, well, point two is a teensy uh, risk for a medicine that has been uh, touted as being so effective. And right. I mean, as emergency physicians and as a physicians in general, we're always constantly uh, balancing pros and cons, right? And risk and benefit evaluation. They could be very extensive evaluation. Those could be very quick, spur of the moment evaluation. So uh, I was thinking, you know, there are other uh, other treatments that we, we um, have uh, that have even greater risk than a 0.2 risk, right? Um, sure. So I, I was n- not convinced that that is, is, is enough of a, a, a negative uh, against k But then as I was reading, I think the point for some of these um, authors is that, first of all, the medicine is not proven to actually reduce potassium. Secondly, then now we've got information, we've got studies that suggest um, a very consistent, strong link to a small but uh, devastating complication. So when you have a combination of no proof of effectiveness, and then you've got some potential small, although small, but potential devastating consequence in a senior citizen, they really are, I think, putting the two together as two negatives for this 
this medication. Um, and so that's, that's the thought process, I think, that if you have some medicine that is not even really proven to work at all, and it's got a risk, a small risk, why use it? Yeah, I think the question that comes to my mind is, what if I were working out up where I had no resources, right. you know, Ooh, on yeah. an island by myself? Right. What, what, what would I do in that situation? And right. it's been ingrained in my mind since I began my training. k is fundamental in the treatment of hyperkalemia. But I would, you know, debate in my mind, if I were on an island out somewhere, would I use it? And I, you know, that's really something that weighs heavy on me in these type of situations where there's still not enough information. Perhaps I, I probably would. I would probably still yeah. use it. I think it's. I think that is a judgment call. It depends on what practice you're in. Depends on how easy uh, access you have to dialysis, and also depends on how sick the patient is. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, so, what else do we have? There's two new medicines out in the market. One is called Lokelma. In fact, we have it here. I confirmed that. Lokelma, also known as ZS9, what it does is it exchanges sodium and ammonia for potassium. Um, it binds more than nine times the potassium uh, than KXLA reportedly. And the onset is one to six, six hours or so with a duration of between four to 12 hours. Um, there are some minor GI symptoms and edema side effects, but apparently it's very, very safe. Um, the next one, the other one is um, Valtessa or Potiromer. This one exchanges calcium for potassium, does not cause swelling of the colon. It has an onset of between seven hours to 48 hours, and the duration is for the duration is 12 hours to 24 hours. Um, it can cause most, it can cause hypomagnesemia, which is its most common side effect. Um, and it has to be um, administered six hours apart or separated six hours from um, any other medications. So this is not as, it is more cumbersome to administer and also it is much slower to onset than Adolokelma. All right, so learning focus number two. I just want to quickly go through um, EKG abnormalities in hyper-K. This is really kind of a great short lecture Dr. Amal Matu did at Essentials a couple of years ago. He says, how do you avoid a clean kill with wide complex tachycardia? It's a, <laughs> it's a terrific 10-minute talk. It's, it's available on YouTube. You can look at it. So let's, let's listen to him. But when I see something like this, instead of calling it an RWCT, what I actually call this is an RRWCT. And what does the extra R stand for? Regular, really wide complex tachycardia. It's not just wide, it's really wide. And what I mean by that is that when you see the QRS complexes greater than one big box, greater than 200 milliseconds, I don't want you to ever think about VTAC as your number one diagnosis. The first diagnosis I want you to think about whenever you see a regular, really wide complex tachycardia is tox or metabolic. Right. So um, he was talking about, you know, when you see that really wide uh, complex tachycardia, think tox or metabolic cause first. So he said to consider calcium and bicarb first rather than antiarrhythmics. He talks about uh, how antiarrhythmics can actually kill a patient who has that kind of a uh, um, wide complex tachycardia. So then, to my credit, <laughs> I did a IQ episode yeah. back in uh, back uh, about a year ago on IQ number fourteen. I did that with Dr. Elizabeth Apney, and it was all about um, hyperkalemia. I had three patients that I talked about that were hyperk, and so. I actually just want to run through quickly just examples of hyperkalemia EKG changes. Now, we were always taught, Jonathan, since, you know, being baby doctors, that there's a sort of a stepwise progression of EKG changes. Um, right. But there, is, there really, really isn't. Um, Dr. Um, Scott Weingart, um, in a funny way, was saying how you, you can go from normal sinus to um, cardiac arrest, uh, BFib, in no time just like that. So um, I think that that's important to keep in mind that we don't really have a stepwise EKG change uh, as we used to always think. So here is, um, these are all my patients or uh, a colleague's patients, but this is a 75-year-old who um, 
is on uh, Soul Law, and he comes in very, very bradycardic. No P waves at all. Right. So then after I treated him, ta-da! <laughs> His potassium was 5.9. So this gentleman is on both a beta blocker and uh, his potassium was not that high. It was just a little bit above normal here. But I think probably, uh, my guess is that the combination uh, caused this uh, uh, loss of the P wave. Um, so 82-year-old male with uh, a pacemaker, he just got the pacemaker a few weeks before he came in. Uh, with profound weakness, and his potassium was nine. So then after the treatment, this is easy, KG. What do you think? You're saving lives left and right. <laughs> uh, it's my blog. I can't show I off. Here. <laughs> 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 okay. This is a 67 female, credit to Dr. Uh, uh, Craig, 9.5 potassium. Look at that. Wow. That's crazy, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. I was working with him and I said, is he, is she alive? Is she coding? He said, no, she's talking to me. <laughs> wow. Yeah, right. Exactly. So after the treatment, this is what the hurricane look like. Crazy, right? All right. Then 81 year old female who came in in cardiac arrest and mm -hmm. she came in with her, uh, pacer on, we were doing CPR on her and then I had them turn the pacer off and this is what it looked like. Yeah. So this lady's potassium uh, was 7.2. We were able to uh, get ROSC on her, but she uh, was put on hospice and passed away the next day. Wow. And well, those are great cases, Alice. I know. I know. There's so many of them. My last point, my nose knows. I didn't tell you this when I first presented a case because they would have given it away completely. But as, <laughs> as, soon, as, as soon as I stepped into the room, I, I said, this is not a panic attack. I can smell DKA. I walked in. Well, you're one of the lucky ones. It's only a, some people can smell that, some can't, right? Can you? I can't smell us. Really? So, all through mm -hmm. my career, I've been able to identify it. Once in a while, I mistake alcohol for it, but it's really not an alcohol smell. It's a very distinct smell. So, when the nurse pulled me into the room for this panicking kid or panicking young man as soon as i stepped in i'm like okay this is not a panic attack he's in dka so hence the bedside potassium bedside glucose because i know and the ekg because i know the dka gets this sick and they can have hyper k <laughs> so i didn't want to give that away but my nose knows mm, <laughs> you do know alice you got a sixth sense <laughs> I, I think i do but uh, well, Jonathan, thank you so much for uh, participating with me again on my uh, blog. Okay. I really appreciate your input and you're uh, always willing to teach and always willing to share your thoughts with me. So I appreciate it very, very much. You bet. It's always a pleasure, Alice. I enjoy these great cases. Thanks for letting right. me be a part of it. All righty. So, everybody, thank you again uh, for your viewership and your support for my blog. I hope to see you guys sometime this year. So, bye. Until next time. Bye, Jonathan. Thank you. Bye, Alice. Thanks a lot.